the second part of our gathering today, new research on the impact of climate change in Africa. Uh, I thought the first session went extraordinarily well, and I think the stuff that Colin and I Colin and Idina are using, putting out there is just absolutely uh, terrific. Very excited about uh, this session, but before getting into description, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank our Dean, Bob Hutchings, for being here with us and uh, taking time out to hear the great work that you're doing. I also want to thank Admiral Bob Inman, uh, who not only supported this uh, program as interim dean, but has been on the advisory committee of the CCAPS and Arbor Project since the very beginning. And of course, I want to especially thank our two guests from Washington, uh, Rick Engel from the uh, National Intelligence Council and uh, Dr. James Harvey from the Defense Department, and to thank them for making this trip to hear this research, and in particular to thank um, um, Jim Harvey and uh, the Minerva Project for making the funds available for this uh, uh, terrific research. Now, as you know, uh, CCAPS seeks to better understand the relationship between the growing threat of climate change and the ability of African countries to manage complex emergencies that may arise from climate change. Now, one of the core missions of the Strauss Center and a critical goal of the CCAPS program is to train the next generation of scholars and practitioners uh, in developing research and strategies that we will need to address the most pressing global challenges uh, that will emerge and we will face in the years to come. And this fits in very well with the tradition of the LBJ School and particularly the policy research project, which is uh, one of the nation's most unique curricular vehicles for bringing about this kind of practical, real world experience and to help train the next uh, generation of scholars and engaging them in implied stu applied study and the development of scholarship with a practical policy focus. Now, under the masterful direction of uh, Dr. Josh Busby, the graduate students in this PRP class have spent the last year analyzing and mapping Africa's vulnerabilities to climate change and developing practical tools <coughs> that can be used by policymakers addressing these issues. I want to thank the students uh, in this PRP. I, I've been at the LBJ School for 10 years. I've seen any number of policy research projects at this point, maybe over 100. I have just, from what I've heard, what I've seen, this is without doubt, to my mind, the most impressive policy research project that the LBJ School has ever put on. And you guys deserve a, 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 a huge amount of admiration for what you've done. So let's thank the school. There were a lot of people behind the scenes helping uh, to make this work. Um, Kaiba, uh, Ashley, Laura, uh, Susie, Todd, where's Todd? Todd. Uh, and the whole uh, Minerva, Christine, uh, the, uh, the whole CCAPS Minerva team. But uh, truly the person who was the kind of mad genius behind this and pulled this all together was Dr. Josh Busby. You know, all of us have had to do PRPs, and I don't know, is Eugene here? It's, it can be the most rewarding and the most difficult teaching experience possible. And I think a lot of us went into seeing how this would go with a lot of trepidation. I, I am just in awe of how you've been able to pull this all together and uh, uh, in such an impressive and timely manner. So before we get any further, let's thank Josh Busby. All right. Well, thanks so much to all of you for coming. I'm going to give a few introductory remarks just to set the stage. Um, what we're going to do today is present the results of a year-long course looking at climate change and security in Africa with a specific focus on mapping climate vulnerability using geographic information systems or GIS, which is a software program that allows you to represent data spatially. Now, uh, I, special thanks really go out to the team of people who are involved in teaching the students a set of skills. Uh, to be able to carry out this work. Uh, I really want to recognize the TA for the course, Sean Strange, who has done yeoman's work transferring these skills uh, to the students. So uh, special thanks to Sean. <laughs> also, um, Kaiba and Todd, uh, who have already been recognized. Uh, again, without the three of them, I probably would have had a nervous breakdown months ago. So, uh, so thanks to them uh, for their involvement in the, co in the course. And obviously, thanks to the students for enduring this. Um, uh, it's been a tremendous effort, and I hope you've learned a lot from it. I'd also like to thank the Strauss Center for their support for the course, um, as well as uh, community and regional planning uh, for their facilities and support. Uh, Bjorn Sleto is here today from community and regional planning. Uh, really, this uh, emerged as a sort of uh, kernel of an idea about a year ago, and it's amazing how far we've come and been able to pull it off. Again, final thanks to the Department of Defense 
whose support for CCAPS made this project possible. And I'd also like to acknowledge our invited guests uh, from Washington, Rich and, uh, and James, and also uh, Dean uh, Hutchings and Admiral Inman. Thanks so much for being here today to uh, take part in this. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a brief overview on the project, and then there'll be group presentations for about 15 minutes each, uh, looking at, uh, at the continent of Africa by region, starting with East Central Africa, moving to West Africa, going to Southern Africa, and then closing with uh, North Africa. Hopefully there'll be plenty of time for Q&A, about 45 to 50 minutes. So that's sort of uh, the order of events for this next two hours. Again, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the project, it is a five-year, $7.6 million grant from the U.S. Department of Defense involving a number of researchers here at UT, as well as partner institutions, several of whom are here today from the University of North Texas, who uh, spoke earlier, but also uh, we have uh, team members from Trinity College in Dublin, College of William and Mary, as well as Southwestern University. And the idea of the project uh, from uh, uh, from sort of conception to conclusion is to look at uh, the issue in its totality, beginning with uh, uh, problem diagnosis, moving to uh, prescription. So we start, and the focus of today's discussion is on vulnerability assessments and causal connections, but the other parts of the project focus on uh, governance capacity and conflict resolution, which is a part that Alan Cooperman here at the LBJ School is heavily involved in. And then the final part is looking at prescription, identifying where the assistance for uh, climate adaptation is going, both in terms of amounts and specifically geographically, to see if where we've identified where the problems are maps up with where the amounts of, uh, of foreign assistance are directed to try and address it. So one of the reasons Africa is a particularly important uh, place to focus on is that it's uh, especially vulnerable to climate change. It has low adaptive capacity. It has high dependence on rain-fed agriculture. But it sort of begs the question of what constitutes vulnerability. And there are a lot of different definitions out there. Here's one from the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change, which focuses more on the physical effects of climate change on different places. But there's another one from the United Nations Strategy for Disaster Reduction, which sees uh, vulnerability as being something more than just physical exposure. And if you think about the uh, events in New Orleans uh, uh, several years ago with the hurricane, it, it, a better governed New Orleans, a better disaster management plan, a richer New Orleans. There are lots of different ways in which we understand that uh, New Orleans was particularly vulnerable given the confluence of both physical exposure but other things that were happening there. And so the rationale uh, for our work is to focus on vulnerability that isn't just purely based on physical exposure. And we wanted to get it at, at it as fine-grained a level to develop sub-national maps of climate change vulnerability. It is not enough to say that Ethiopia is vulnerable to climate change, but which parts and why? So it includes physical hazards, but it also includes uh, uh, socioeconomic and political contributors. So let me say a little bit about our approach. We endeavored to build an index of uh, composite vulnerability, pulling in uh, four different baskets or processes that we think that the project level uh, uh, were the main drivers of vulnerability. We aggregated them. They were each weighted equally. And within each of these baskets of processes, there were a number of sub-indicators. And what the students have done is taken this basic template and, deci and decided what are the regional specific indicators or processes that we think are important. So they've sort of riffed off this uh, initial template, changing the weights, changing the indicators, identifying the specific characteristics of the region that they thought were important. And so we have physical exposure, we have community household vulnerability, we have governance and political violence, and we have population as our main baskets. Let me say a little bit about each of them in turn from our initial uh, template, just to give you some intuitions for how this was initially carried out. So in terms of physical exposure, we focus in our work uh, at the project level on uh, historic uh, disaster exposure. And one of the reasons we do that is that's where the data is available. Uh, prospectively, we're partnering with the Jackson School of Geosciences to identify uh, GIS-compatible models of future climate vulnerability. So much of the data that we are focusing on today is looking at uh, past historic uh, disasters as an intuition, as a guide to where we think the disasters might be in the future because we expect to see more natural disasters associated with climate change. But this is one of the broader limitations that, uh, that is at the project level, that we're focused on historic 
uh, disasters. But we are pulling in this physical exposure because without that, uh, you know, it, the whole project wouldn't make sense. Uh, obviously, physical exposure is a major piece. But we know that at the household or community level, people's initial ability to respond varies greatly. You know, in terms of their how sick they are, how well educated they are, their ability to cope at the micro level really depends on a number of other factors. So we pull in education and health variables, at least in our template model from which the students uh, derive their own. And yet, in many instances, if you think about the recent earthquake in, um, in Haiti, which obviously had nothing to do with climate change, but it, 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 it made clear that many natural disasters are uh, swamp the ability of local communities and households to respond. And really, the ability for uh, uh, a country to be able to respond varies greatly depending on the quality of governance. And so we bring in another broader process focused on indicators based on governance and political violence. And there are a host of them that we included in our template model on government effectiveness, voice and accountability, degree of integration in the international system, political stability, and so on. But all of this would be a little pointless if we didn't focus on where the people are, right? So our final basket focuses on the population density. And what we do for each of these processes is we classify them into categories from uh, least to most vulnerable assigning weights, obviously, to the baskets as a whole and also to indicators within them. And what we do at the index level is integrate them, add them, and give you a complex portrait of composite vulnerability. So we can identify at the subnational level where we think the most vulnerable places are in Africa, uh, across the continent, and based on that, we think this is where policymakers can begin to concentrate their resources. Obviously, we're going to do field work to follow up this, and there are different weighting schemes, so part of the work involved with the student uh, uh, regional papers is, is to interrogate the model and see, does this capture it right? Do the same places, no matter the model specification, uh, appear to be the most vulnerable? Is Western Ethiopia really the most vulnerable place on the continent? And so that's the kind of work that you're going to see in the next hour or so. So I hope this sets the stage. I'm sure it raises more questions than it answers. But I, I hope it gives you a, a bit of a feel for how we carried out the work and look forward uh, in the next set of presentations to really getting in uh, in more depth. So I'll turn it over to our East Central group for the first presentation. So come on down. So good afternoon everyone, my name is Pace Phillips and I'm part of the group that looked at East and Central Africa along with Bonnie Doty, Erica Grajeda, and Atul Shrestha. Oh. Hmm. Okay, sorry about that. So to give you, I'll start by giving a overview of the region and then I'll talk about some of the predictions for climate change. Then I'll go through some of the specifics of our model, and then Bonnie will take you through some of the findings, a case study of Ethiopia, and some of the implications. So this region is extremely diverse, geographically, politically, and culturally. So the landscape varies from the deserts of northern Sudan to the jungles in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The governments vary from authoritarian Eritrea to the failed state of Somalia to the multi-party democracies in Rwanda and Tanzania. So in many ways, it's difficult to generalize about this area, but there are a few things we can say. Almost every country in this region has had notable civil conflict within the last 30 years. Recently, in the popular press and also in the academic literature, there's been talk of climate conflicts. So the argument is that due to natural reasons and expansion of farmland, that the grazing lands have been reduced and the pastoralists of the region have come into closer contact with settled farmers and there's been subsequent clashes. Now, whether there's a direct link from climate change to conflict is debatable. But what we can say is that this, this region has been under intense environmental stress 
and water stress, and is heavily reliant on rain-fed agriculture. So those factors, coupled with poor governance, has led to intense problems of food security in that area, which adds a added stress. So now the predictions for climate change. East Africa, like all of Africa, is predicted to get hotter. Unlike the rest of Africa, though, East Africa is predicted to get more rainfall. This would be a net benefit for the region, except that rainfall is likely to be more variable. So when rain does come, it's likely to be heavier, and there uh, should be longer breaks during the growing season, which has a huge impact on the farmers. So this variability in rainfall will likely bring more droughts, more floods, and along with deforestation, more mudslides, as, we, uh, as we've seen recently in Uganda. So now, this is our approach to assessing human security issues and vulnerability to climate change in the region is very similar to the CCAPS project. We have a measure for population density, for household vulnerability, and for governance. Though our measures for governance and household vulnerability differ slightly from theirs. But what I want to focus on is the environmental vulnerability. And we see this as coming from two components. So one is vulnerability to climate and weather events, and another is human-induced environmental stress. So that includes deforestation, water resources, and dependence on agriculture. And this is what makes our model unique and what we've added. So I'll focus on that a little bit more. By our assessment, Somalia, Ethiopia, Burundi, and Tanzania all have suffered uh, the worst environmental degradation from human activity. <coughs> the Democratic Republic of Congo surprisingly uh, fares well in this measure. So any measure that shows the DRC is doing well needs to be explained a little bit more. <laughs> so I'll go through the, the three components of this environmental stress measure. The first third of this measure is the annual rate of deforestation. So East Africa has experienced extreme deforestation recently. Many of the countries have been cutting their forest at more than 1% a year. So between 2000 and 2005, many of these countries saw a 5% reduction in their existing forest. So we don't think of deforestation just as the loss of trees, but it's also a proxy for other important environmental factors like soil qua quality, water capture, and also domestic environmental policies. For example, Rwanda has seen its forest increase due to concerted environmental efforts in that country. Another third of this environmental stress basket is annual groundwater withdrawals. Outside of Sudan and Somalia, uh, reliance on groundwater isn't a huge issue in East Africa, though it is for the rest of Africa, and that's why we've included, included this measure. The last third of the environmental stress category is the percentage of the labor force in agriculture. So we believe that countries that have a larger portion of their population uh, who rely on consistent, predictable rainfall are going to be more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So moving on to physical vulnerability. The East and Central African region has been the site of many um, climate-related natural disasters. As you can see, the physical exposure um, to these disasters sort of snakes through the central part of the region, particularly Western Ethiopia, Southern Sudan, northern Uganda and western Kenya. These areas have been prone over, the, over recent decades to um, climate-related natural disasters on both extremes, both prolonged droughts and um, uh, extensive flooding. And these events are likely to continue in these same areas um, over the next few years. We also included a governance basket like the CCAPS project model, 
Um, this sort of gives us an indication about the ability of a government to respond to the immediate needs as well as the long-term adaptation measures um, of climate change. Um, and not surprisingly, the DRC and Somalia um, have the worst governance in the region, with, and they're followed by uh, Sudan at a close second. I want to point out some of the, um, the dark red spots in Sudan. These areas are um, little pockets of past conflict that are contributing to um, very poor governance. Household vulnerability gives us a good idea about the ability of a population to cope with natural disasters and um, also the ability to uh, adapt on the long term to changing conditions. Um, as we can see, the DRC, Ethiopia, um, some spots in Burundi and southern Sudan have high levels of household vulnerability. These regions um, are particularly, uh, they score particularly poorly in uh, levels of education, so they have low levels of education, poor access to social services, and also um, poor baseline health conditions. We also included population density because we're really concerned with the effects of climate change on people. 75% um, of the population in this region lives in rural areas, which is unique to East and Central Africa. Um, there's a high concentration of inhabitants in uh, the Central Ethiopian area, uh, Central Ethiopia area, as well as um, the areas surrounding Lake Victoria. This latter concentration really kind of gives a good indication about the importance of water in the region. And so now, pulling all of these baskets and indicators together, we were able to arrive at an assessment of the overall vulnerability of East and Central Africa to climate change. Uh, as you can see, uh, Ethiopia, Western Ethiopia, is perhaps the uh, most vulnerable area in the region, and I'll come back to this in just a moment. We also see Southern Sudan and uh, the tri-border area around Uganda, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo to be highly vulnerable. These areas have um, witnessed prolonged conflict, um, high levels of household vulnerability, and they've also been the sites of um, extensive droughts and flooding. It's also worth pointing out, as Bates mentioned, that the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, performs pretty well under our uh, model. Um, as he alluded to earlier, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo has um, low levels of environmental stress, and it really hasn't seen much, uh, many climate-related natural disasters in the past. So therefore, um, it looks pretty good here. So as I mentioned, um, Western Ethiopia is perhaps the most vulnerable uh, area to climate change under, um, under our model. And this is really driven by many different things. Um, first, on the aggregate, the entire country is, uh, scores, has very high vulnerability across all of our indicators except for government. Furthermore, the, the central and western areas of Ethiopia um, are unique uh, and are extremely vulnerable um, for several reasons. One, the almost 80 million people, or a majority of the almost 80 million people in Ethiopia live in this central area um, from the highlands of Tigray down to the um, plains of Aromia. And next, this area is um, particularly susceptible to climate-related natural disasters. Um, we see a lot of, uh, or historically we've seen a lot of droughts in the north and flooding in the south. Um, We've seen the interaction of these two components at play throughout recent history in Ethiopia. First, for example, the famine of 1984 to 1986 um, in the Walla region. The Walla region, uh, what is now the Afar, Tigray, and, uh, and northern Amhara region states that you see on the map. Um, in 1984, there was a severe uh, shortage of rainfall in the Walla region that led and ultimately turned into a drought. And, uh, as a result, there was uh, poor, poor food, food security and um, there was a crisis at hand. The government, however, was not able to respond, or perhaps, um, according to some, not willing to respond because it was uh, busy fighting insurgents in the liberation movements in northern Tigray and southern Aromia. As a result, hundreds of thousands of people died and millions were left destitute. Um, more recently, in the southern region, we've seen lots of flooding. Um, in 2006, uh, increased seasonal rainfall, heavy seasonal rainfall, um, led the Omo River to burst over its banks and led to excessive flooding. In that case, 900 people lost their lives and uh, crops were damaged and tens of thousands of people were displaced and required uh, humanitarian assistance from the international community. So using these two examples, we've seen um, how 
high population density and extreme climate events can come into contact and cause um, uh, severe threats to human security and uh, humanitarian disasters. So finally, um, bringing it back out to the, the region, and just to sum up, um, the Eastern and Central Africa is uh, faced with many problems that um, will inf influence its ability to deal with climate change. First, we've seen that environmental stress is, is relatively high across the region. Um, there's a high dependence on rain-fed agriculture, both um, at the household level and at the national level. There's uh, high concentrations of inhabitants in certain regions that are particularly prone to na uh, climate-related natural, natural disasters. And um, droughts and floods have plagued the region for the past few decades. All of these problems combined um, fall on levels, relatively um, poor levels of governance and high levels of household vulnerability. And we really believe that the, the confluence of all of these factors will, um, will greatly impact the ability of gov both governments and populations to adapt to climate change, both on the immediate term and in the long term. So in sum, you can see in East and Central Africa, as Professor Busby alluded to for the continent um, in general, um, climate change here is not a cause, is not caused by just one factor, but rather a confluence of many different factors. And those factors, um, as you've seen on these maps, um, really vary across each country. There's a lot of subnational variation. So um, it's important to pick out, yes, Ethiopia is um, highly vulnerable to climate change, and um, Democratic Republic of Congo is vulnerable to um, poor governance and conflict. But where do they all come together, and where do they, where, um, where do all these things come together, and where do policymakers and um, international aid organizations, perhaps, where do they focus their resources? And as we can see, um, Western Ethiopia is, in fact, most vulnerable to climate change under our model, and Southern Sudan and that tri-border area with Uganda. So thank you very much, and we look forward to sharing more about our uh, research with you during the Q&A section. Our next team is uh, West Africa, so come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Darrell Canito. My colleagues are Emily Joyner and Jesse Sampson. And we're going to be looking at uh, climate change in West Africa, focusing specifically on the adaptive capacity <coughs> of, governance, of governments, basically their ability to uh, deal with the effects of climate change. Uh, this is a basic rundown of uh, what we're going to be discussing. I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to West Africa. Then Emily's going to talk about the new elements of governance that we added, and also the vulnerability models and, and components. And then Jesse's going to finish up with the findings and policy recommendations. So this is our region of West Africa. Uh, it excludes the Sahel, Sahara countries that are usually in, in West Africa. But it, it, so it concentrates on the, uh, the savanna and tropical areas down here. Um, some of the characteristics of this region are important, and we chose to look at them when measuring governance in, in the region. We looked at uh, the importance of religion, ethnic diversity, and mineral resources. Now, uh, this region is particularly uh, high in ethnic diversity. You have uh, tropical regions down here where you usually generally have a, a high degree of ethnic diversity. Um, the cultures in these regions are uh, generally different <coughs> from uh, the, the, the cultures to the north, which are in the savanna and Sahel regions. Those uh, the, the most important uh, cultural difference that we noticed was religion. Um, the green area here are the uh, Muslim areas, the blue are the Christian areas, and the box areas are areas where they sort of uh, uh, mix together. 
Over the past thousand years, Islam spread uh, south from North Africa, and it, it sort of was halted by the dense tropical area. And uh, later on, Europeans came up through the coast and spread Christianity northwards. And uh, these dynamics of religion play an important role in the socio-political dynamics of the countries, specifically from Cameroon here over to Cote d'Ivoire. Also, uh, mineral resources are also important. Um, over here in the Guinea coast from Nigeria all the way down to the Republic of the Congo, you have uh, countries that, uh, whose economies are largely dependent on oil. Over here in the far west, you have an abundance of uh, mineral resources, diamonds, and, in, and Guinea has an, uh, a number of uh, minerals. They also have half of the world's known uh, bauxite reserves. So this is a map of the ecosystems of West Africa. The, the great green areas are tropical fo uh, forests. The beige areas are largely savanna, and the yellow is this semi-arid Sahel region. Concerning uh, climate change, the region has to worry about uh, two basic effects, rainfall variability and uh, sea level rise. Um, some areas, particularly in the north around here in the uh, Sahel and savanna regions, they will uh, face uh, um, decreased rainfall, and they have to worry about drought. Other areas in, in, in the south will have uh, increased rainfall, and they have to worry about floods. Um, concerning uh, sea level rise, um, as, uh, glo uh, as uh, global warming increases, the sea level will rise, and it affects populations on the coast. Uh, you can, if you can see the little orange areas here, in the Niger Delta and over here in the west in uh, Senegal and uh, Sierra Leone, uh, these mangrove areas will be particularly vulnerable um, as the ecosystems will be destroyed as sea levels rise. Now the, um, the people in West Africa will be vulnerable largely because most people are dependent on the environment for their livelihoods. Uh, most people in the region are uh, subsistence farmers and um, they rely on rain-fed agriculture which will be largely affected by the rainfall variability. Um, also, the pastoralists who generally live in, in the northern regions in the uh, Sahel, um, they will be affected as their herds depend on the land and uh, droughts would uh, make them more vulnerable. And mostly in the southern, uh, on the coastal regions, um, the fishermen will be affected by the uh, rise in sea level when the, uh, the mangroves are destroyed and they uh, overtake the fisheries in the region. So in 2009, you had a particularly devastating flood in West Africa. Um, it was the result of unusually high rainfall, and it uh, affected uh, 12 countries in, in the region. It, it affected 12 countries in the region, um, uh, and 100, a, a million people, and resulted in the deaths of two, 200 people. These red areas are um, areas that were affected most. Um, this area here uh, it shows a picture of uh, Ogadougou in the, the capital of Burkina Faso. Um, it, it shows a picture of the devastation where uh, 150,000 people were displaced. Now this event highlights the inability of governments, governments in the region to deal with uh, um, these um, uh, disaster effects. Um, and as climate change increases, um, 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 you will have more devastations like these. And so this is why we decided to focus on uh, the ability of governance, governments to uh, deal with climate change. So now I'm going to pass it to Emily to talk about the uh, vulnerability basket. Okay. Um, so as Darrell mentioned, we really focused um, in our research on looking at the impacts of um, various factors on the abilities of governments to adapt to changing circumstances that will be caused by climate change. And in looking at the region, the characteristics of oil and mineral dependence and ethnic and religious diversity really stood out to us as being particularly important in the types of decisions that governments make in terms of allocating their resources and in the ability of households to deal with changing circumstances. Um, so a couple examples of how um, this might play out include the possibility for um, lower investments in adaptive strategies um, and inequitable resource distribution generally. Um, looking at how governments choose to spend their resources and help their, their populations to, um, to cope. There are also um, particular 
particular environmental impacts of oil and mineral extraction. And the picture, oh, not that. Um, the picture up on the upper right of the slide is of the Niger Delta um, and of the effects there of both air and um, water contamination from the oil. And finally, um, we've also looked at um, ethnic and religious diversity as a factor on the weakening of social networks, the willingness of communities to come together with people of different backgrounds and deal with changing circumstances and the potential higher likelihood for conflict in these regions as well. Um, so what we have done in our work is to look at the governance component of the vulnerability model that was discussed at the outset of today's presentation. Um, and we've incorporated uh, very, uh, components of mineral dependence and ethno and religious diversity into that basket. And then we've also included the um, household vulnerability, disaster exposure, and population density baskets that were also discussed as part of this composite vulnerability. So our first step was to look at ways of representing oil and mineral dependence and ethno-religious diversity and incorporating those into the model. This map shows um, oil and mineral exports as a percentage of GDP for countries in the region. Um, you will note um, Equatorial Guinea and Republic of Congo are the countries with the most concentration in these sectors. Um, there the concentration almost reaches 90%. Uh, Nigeria and Gabon follow thereafter. Um, with regards to ethnic diversity, we chose to include a measure um, that's termed ethnic polarization in our model. This, um, this component actually measures the percentage of the population that belongs to ethnic groups with political representation. Um, and as you will note, um, the countries in this region fall <coughs> in the middle 50% of the distribution um, for the continent which represents both um, the level of ethnic diversity, but also attempts by governments to be inclusive. And our third factor is that of religious diversity. Um, this map shows um, the diversity as a function of how large the religious majority population may be. Um, and you'll note from the continent map that the most diverse countries fall right across the center of the continent, which gets at what Darrell was talking about, about the division between Muslim and Christian populations. Um, in our region, Guinea-Bissau, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and Nigeria are countries with particularly diverse populations. So adding these components together um, into the governance basket with other measures of political stability um, and government effectiveness, we come up with these results. Um, Central African Republic is the most vulnerable country in the region, and this is driven high, um, by high levels of mineral dependence and low levels of government effectiveness. Um, and other countries with high levels of vulnerability include Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Cote d'Ivoire, um, which are similarly driven by um, issues of government effectiveness, but also issues of religious diversity and, um, and ethnic diversity. Um, this map shows the household vulnerability scores for the region of West Africa. Uh, the most vulnerable country on here is Liberia. Um, Liberia um, scores poorly in um, access to health, education, um, and other measures poten potentially due to the um, civil conflict that occurred here in the 1990s. Um, you'll also notice that there are several region or several countries where the northern regions are of a slightly different color, um, indicating a higher level of vulnerability. Um, and this has occurred because these regions um, are have show higher levels of infant mortality and of underweight um, children within their populations. And incidentally, these are also the regions of highly concentrated Muslim populations. This map shows disaster exposure um, for our region. You'll note that the Central African Republic has a, a large area of high vulnerability in it. Um, this is primarily driven by forest fires and droughts. You'll also note the Niger Delta, um, which is vulnerable to both sea level rise and flooding. Um, along the coast of Ghana, um, over to Benin. This is driven um, primarily actually by droughts and some of the variation in that rainfall um, pattern that we were mentioned earlier. And other areas of high vulnerability in the Gambia, southern Senegal, and Guinea-Bissau, which comes down to, again, this issue of um, low elevation um, vulnerability to, to sea level rise and then floods along several of the rivers. And finally, our final component of the vulnerability model is that of population density. You can also note from the continent-wide map that this is one of the most um, densely populated regions in Africa. Nigeria alone um, 
has um, more than five cities with large populations of more than a million, including the largest city in the, in, um, the region, which is Lagos in Nigeria. Um, and you'll also notice high levels of population in um, Douala, the capital of, of uh, the, one of the large cities in Cameroon, Accra and Abidjan in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, and also Dakar and Conakry um, in Senegal and Guinea. I'm going to pass things over to Jesse for um, some of our findings. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so the last step we took was to uh, construct a map that takes all of these various uh, factors that Emily and Durrell introduced us in, into account. And the results look something like this. And uh, we can easily see um, some patterns that emerge here already, including high vulnerability here in the delta. Uh, the dark areas represent, this darkest area represents being in the uh, top 20% of vulnerability for Africa. So we see these patterns here in uh, the Niger Delta, northern Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea Bissau. Um, uh, our group, um, however, I was concerned with uh, these maps because while you can see some patterns, they do have a tendency to resemble a Jackson Pollock painting to the untrained observer. Um, so we worked on a couple of different techniques to sort of draw out these underlying patterns in the data and find out where the persistent areas of vulnerability are. The first technique that we used um, was suggested to us by our mentors at the Strauss Center. Uh, it was a, um, just a basic difference between the original map and the, and the current map. So each point has a score, subtract one from the other, and you have areas of difference. The primary areas of difference, as indicated by dark purple, are uh, northern Nigeria and northern Cote d'Ivoire. And if you'll remember from earlier in the discussion, uh, we um, talked about the ethnic and religious divisions in this area, and also how that expresses itself in terms of uh, poverty and uh, vulnerability at the household level. So we think that's good um, and accurate. And uh, you might wonder why some uh, regions come up as less vulnerable. They may not be um, less vulnerable at the baseline, but they do show up as uh, relatively less vulnerable than these extremely high vulnerability areas in uh, countries like Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire. The next technique that we experimented with was cluster analysis, which um, is, is, is borrowed uh, from law enforcement or epidemiology, perhaps. And um, it's, it's uh, based on the idea that um, if we are looking at uh, muggings, for example, to use a crime example, uh, we would look at neighborhoods that have a much higher than average concentration of muggings and look perhaps for underlying drivers of muggings that happen more in those neighborhoods than in others. We've applied this principle to a vulnerability in Africa. Um, so looking at these administrative regions that have the highest levels of vulnerability, we can see um, here in Biso, in, in uh, Guinea Biso, it's the capital, it's a um, city with a very high population. and um, uh, it, uh, it is a country that depends almost entirely on cashew nut exports and fishing for its export earnings. So this is a place that might be very vulnerable. Um, also moving over to Nigeria, we see um, Lagos, which is, a, which is a coastal megacity, as they say in the literature, and uh, that there are millions of people living there that are um, living in low-lying areas that could be vulnerable to uh, flooding uh, based on sea level rise. Also Wari here in the Niger Delta. Is in, uh, is in a Delta State, low-lying area that produces about 40% um, of Nigeria's oil. That's very important to us. And also, uh, this technique um, allows us to um, give scores for each administrative area, which makes it a little bit more helpful uh, for the policy uh, dialogue. And speaking of the policy dialogue, what are some of the implications for policy that um, come from this research? Uh, we've divided them in two categories. First of all, there are implications for further research, um, basically uh, that we can um, we ought to develop better indicators to um, assess which countries will be good and which countries will be bad at adapting to climate change. Um, another thing that would be helpful in terms of research would be to improve subnational indicators to uh, get a more um, comprehensive picture of vulnerability at a granular level, um, especially in terms of things like ethnicity, religion, uh, household dynamics. Um, and then finally, in the research section, we can um, improve the performance of climate models at the regional level. Um, most climate models are calibrated to predict weather all around the world, and that's good for the International Panel on Climate Change, but it uh, is not quite effective uh, for areas like West Africa that have unique sort of um, climate patterns. So um, that would also help with this work. Uh, and in terms of what governments and aid organizations can use this data to do, um, first of all, we think that uh, government capacity for adaptation should involve, uh, should inform targeting for aid. Um, so we can look at that last map and think about what are some of the administrative areas that will have the least ability to adapt and direct resources to those areas. And it can help us guide long-range planning and budgeting and um, also uh, for things like scenario analysis. Uh, 
And then uh, finally, um, we can use aid dollars to specifically address issues of adaptation, which um, things like uh, making um, early warning systems. This is uh, for floods. This could help in uh, countries um, where there is bad governance and, and may um, underinvest in public goods like adaptation to climate change. Um, so uh, we'll be excited to hear any of your questions, but um, that will be for the, for the, for the Q&A session later. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you especially to our guests from Washington, D.C., LBJ faculty, and our colleagues at the University of North Texas. My name is Sarah Williams, and my, my group members here are Sachin Shah and Xu Yang, and our group studied climate change vulnerability in Southern Africa. I'm going to begin today by giving you a brief overview of the Southern Africa region. Sachin is going to continue with our methodology and Shu is going to share one of the case studies from our paper on the Zambezi River Basin. And I will finish up with policy implications. This is the Southern Africa region as defined by our project. It composes 11 countries and is home to over 150 million people. As you move south in the region, the climate becomes increasingly arid. And there are also several major important transboundary river basins with which we're particularly concerned. We'll hear a little <coughs> bit more about that later. So this is kind of the relationship that we're studying. We expect climate change to cause increasingly severe floods and droughts, particularly in southern Africa. <coughs> this, combined with the existing environmental stress and it, lack of institutional capacity, <coughs> will result in poor, ag poor long-term agriculture output and increasing competition between different interests for water resources. This, we expect to result in situations that we should be concerned with regarding food supplies. So Sachin is going to share our model. So in terms of our final model, it was comprised of these four uh, baskets that Dr. Busby actually talked about earlier. But we did include one final basket, and we're calling this the vulnerability to water stress. So in terms of vulnerability, in our case, we're talking about high population densities, poor governance, high vulnerabilities to natural disasters, household communities, and vulnerability to water stress. So let's take a look at a little bit of each basket in terms of specific areas of interest. So in terms of population density, the most densely populated areas are on the eastern coast of southern Africa, as well as eastern Zimbabwe. Now, when it comes to vulnerability to poor governance, Zimbabwe clearly stands out. And overall, so in general, southern Africa is very vulnerable to natural disasters. But in particular, the southern African coast, or the eastern coast rather, is highly vulnerable to extreme droughts and extreme floods. And Madagascar, being an island, is vulnerable to cyclones and other damaging storms. Now, in terms of household and community vulnerability, Angola, Mozambique, and Madagascar are highly vulnerable. So as Dr. Busby mentioned earlier, this particular basket is comprised of education and health-related indicators. Now finally, this is the newest basket, vulnerability to stress on water resources. So in the blues here, these, these countries indicate low vulnerable areas to water stress. The lighter shades indicate areas of very high vulnerability. So for example, Namibia, Botswana, on into Mozambique are very vulnerable to water stress. So I'd like to break this particular basket down into its particular indicators. Okay, so the question is, how do we look at vulnerability in terms of water resources? Well, the first thing that we did is we combined five indicators, most of which go into particular water models, whether they're groundwater models or surface water models. First thing we wanted to look at is availability. In our case, we wanted to look at groundwater availability. So this was used to determine the amount of water that's used in a particular country. So in essence, the more plentiful groundwater is in a particular country, the less vulnerable they are. Secondly, with this available water, 
there must be improved access to drinking water. So the higher the percentage of the population that has this access, the less vulnerable they are. Now, how a country uses its water is extremely important when we're talking about extreme droughts and extreme floods. So for example, what we did with this is we talked about the type of use and the quantity used. So we looked at the percentage of irrigated cropland and the percentage of fresh water withdrawn. Now, one of the most important indicators in this particular basket is the dependency ratio. Now, what the dependency ratio is, is the percentage of water used in a particular country that actually originated outside of its borders. So I'd like to look at a regional perspective of the dependency ratio. Now, in this map, the blue countries represent very low dependency ratios. The lighter shades represent high dependency ratios. So what's interesting about this is as you move from northwest to southeast, the countries get have a higher dependency ratio. So again, the water basket, which the dependency ratio is a part of, is just one of the five that we used to create our composite or our final vulner vulnerability model. Now, it's clear from our final basket that Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Madagascar are highly vulnerable. Now, taking these particular regions into account, as well as our focus on water resources, we decided to look at things in the context of river basins, particularly the Zambezi River Basin, where Shu will talk about climatic impacts there. So the Zambezi River Basin crosses eight countries in Southern Africa. It is home to 40 million people, and three of the uh, country capitals located within this area, Lusaka, Harare, and Nairobi. There are also two major dams located along the Zambezi River, the Kariba Dam and Kahara Basar Dam. 70% of the population that live in the Zambezi River Basin is poor and rural, and they rely heavily on agriculture. The IPCC report predicted that the Zambezi River Basin will have some of the greatest changes in precipitation, evaporation, and runoff in a 100-year time frame. That means this region will, will meet decrease in available water resources. Climate change will also increase the severity and frequency of floods and droughts in this area. Earlier this year, the Zambezi River Delta already experienced severe floods and droughts where Sarah will talk about the Mozambique crisis later. There are several challenges in water management in the Zambezi River Basin. Because it only rains from October to April, if the rainfall patterns changes, agricultural planning will become very difficult. Countries in Southern Africa also have different development levels. So they have different core economic sectors. So mining, fisheries, hydroelectric power, Irrigation and human consumption all compete for the limited water resources. <coughs> in Zambia, for example, 99% of the electricity comes from hydropower. So water, equity water allocation is a big challenge in this area. Countries realize that they need to cooperate to cope with droughts and floods, and they also need to build long-term um, sustainable water management in this area. There are two existing water management agreements in, Southern Afri uh, in the Zambezi River Basin. <coughs> One of them is the Southern Africa Development Community Water Protocol. It was created in 2001, and they established guidelines for countries to manage uh, water resources, uh, but there's no implementation or enforcement mechanism, and it does not um, mandate countries to cooperate together. Zambia and Zimbabwe established the Zambezi River Authority to manage the water resources along um, the Zambezi River Basin and the Kariba Dam. But six other countries that located within the river basin were not involved in the Zambezi River Authority. Um, Sarah is going to talk about the implications of poor water management. So as Shu mentioned, Southern African water management institutions are very weak. And we're concerned with this for two reasons and the two different impacts that this can have on climate change. I'm sorry, on food supplies. We expect climate change to cause increasingly severe floods and droughts in the region. This, combined with the existing <coughs> vulnerability that you saw earlier, will have two effects on food supplies. First, floods 
can destroy crops quickly and cause sudden collapses in food supplies. Second, extended drought followed by heavy rain can cause permanent soil degradation that results in a long-term um, decline in agriculture productivity. One or both of these effects in a particular region will have an impact on food supply and cause potential food insecurity. And that's what we're particularly concerned with. Two areas, two of the most vulnerable areas in the region are already experiencing food insecurity problems. Mozambique experienced severe flooding from December 2009 to March 2010 in this region, which is the delta of the Zambezi River. <coughs> The flooding in the Delta region combined with droughts in the south actually resulted in 465,000 additional people requiring food assistance, of which, only, of which the World Food Program predicted that it could only assist 175,000, leaving a large gap in those that need food assistance. 100,000 of these people were actually victims of the double shock, meaning they moved from drought-stricken regions to flood to the River Delta only to have their crops destroyed a second time by flooding. While Mozambique is experiencing food shortages as a result of a shock, Zimbabwe has been persistently food insecure for a decade. The most vulnerable country in the region actually also has a history of food being used as a political weapon, both, both by the pre-independence colonial governments and President Mugabe. Up until 2000, Zimbabwe was actually considered Africa's breadbasket as a net exporter of wheat, tobacco, and corn. Um, President Mugabe's land reforms in 2000 had devastating economic effects, including hyperinflation, and now Zimbabwe is the top recipient of World Food Program aid in the region. <clears throat> so why are we concerned with food insecurity? The dry climate in southern Africa, <coughs> combined with the reliance of citizens on transboundary river basins for their water supply, already makes the region particularly vulnerable to food shortages. We expect this combined with the expectation of increasingly severe floods and droughts and poor water management to cause additional stress on food supplies and water resources. While we can't be sure of the effects in southern Africa, food insecurity has the potential to, fall, to cause future conflict. And we have seen that the most vulnerable parts of our region are already experiencing some of the effects that we expect to worsen as the impacts of climate change intensify in this region. And we'll be happy to take questions in the Q&A. And our final group is uh, our North Africa group, so we look forward to having them come on up. Mm -hmm. I recommend you pop open that other door. A little, little more ventilation. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful classroom, but they have never gotten the air conditioning work effectively. Back yeah. open these water bottles. Yeah. All right, take away. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Um, we're going to look at vulnerability in North Africa. My name is Mark Olivier, um, Christian Glakis, and Sanjeet Dekka. Uh, first, we're going to start out with a brief overview of our um, presentation. We're going to start out with background information on Africa, look at the economies, um, climate, and then the subregions that we broke the, uh, our North African region into. Then we'll move on to methodology, look at the indicators we included. Um, and then the causal mechanisms that we use to analyze the North Africa region. Uh, then we'll move on to findings and wrap up with policy implications. Uh, this is our North African region. We also included Sudan in this because of its connection to Egypt. Um, it's composed of 10 countries. There's approximately 242 million people and it covers an area about 13 million square kilometers. So it's approximately 1.5 times the size of the United States. Um, moving on to the population. It's primarily concentrated along the north of the coast, uh, the south in the Sahel countries of Mali, Niger, and Chad, 
And then most of the population by a large margin is concentrated in Egypt along the Nile and the uh, Nile Delta. Um, moving to the environment, uh, an area this large obviously has a great amount of variation. Uh, the northern part of the country in the red is the Mediterranean type climate. Um, most of the interior of the region, which is unpopulated, is the Sahara Desert. And then the Sahel band across the south is a savanna, semi-arid to arid region. Um, and both the Sahel and the Mediterranean region are undergoing desertification, Sahel particularly so, um, which puts a lot of pressure on those countries because of their agricultural dependence. And then Christians, oh, sorry. And we broke the region into these three areas based on these climatic factors, as well as some of the indicators. So we include Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia in the Maghreb, uh, Egypt and Sudan in Northeast Africa because of the Nile, and then Mali, Niger, and Chad um, in the Sahel region because of their common environment. We didn't include Mauritania or Libya in any of the regions. Mauritania because there's incomplete data, and we didn't feel we could make a confident um, prediction without a complete data. So we left that out, although it would typically probably match Mali, Niger, and Chad. Uh, Libya we didn't include because none of the indicators included it had a high vulnerability. It's, although it has an author authoritarian government, it's remained relatively stable. And now Christian's going to talk about the method methodology. Okay, so we decided to stick with the same four overall indicator baskets as Dr. Busby and the other groups. We have incorporated three new variables into those baskets. So we're looking specifically at water, migration, and terrorism as well. Now for water, we're interested in water for the same reason that all the other groups are interested in water, because of the dependence on agriculture. But we're also interested in the possible co uh, correlation between water availability and interstate conflict. And this is obviously going to be particularly relevant when we look at Egypt and Sudan because each of these countries has very scarce renewable freshwater resources and they're also both very, very highly dependent on the Nile for a high degree of their water usage. And the Nile, of course, originates outside of either of these countries' borders. For migration, we've decided to make a distinction between outgoing migration and incoming migration because we don't feel that these two phenomena affect a country's vulnerability in the same way. For outgoing migration, we do feel that there's a simple and direct relationship between outgoing migration and vulnerability. We think that the more people are leaving your country, the more at risk you will be. For incoming migration, we don't necessarily think that. We think that only in the presence of high levels of poverty and a recent history of ethnic warfare will a country not be able to incorporate incoming migrants into the social fabric of its society in a constructive way. So if those two factors are present, we are going to consider incoming migrants as posing a risk to the country that is welcoming them. For terrorism, we looked at data from the Global Terrorism Database from the University of Maryland, and we're incorporating events that happened between 1995 and 2007 in the 10 countries within our region. We geocoded these events so that we can display them in the, price, excuse me, the precise locations where they occurred, not only so that we can show you where they happened, but also so that we can conduct an analysis to try to see if there's any pattern between where these terrorist attacks were occurring and the different regions in the North African uh, region that our map is telling us are particularly vulnerable. Now looking at a few of the relevant causal mechanisms that we use to try to help us figure out which variables to incorporate into the model, we chose to use water because of, like I said, its, its relevance for agriculture. And so many of the countries in this region are so heavily dependent on agriculture for their national economies. But we also do see this possible co um, correlation between water availability and interstate conflict. So if climate change were to have a negative impact on the available fresh water resources in a region where there have been countries historically competing for water access, we do think that this might increase the chances of interstate conflict between those states. For migration, like I said a moment ago, we only think that incoming migrants will pose a risk to a country's overall vulnerability level in the presence of high levels of poverty and a recent history of ethnic warfare. Now for terrorism, there are two possible links that we're looking at. There's two reasons why we're interested in incorporating terrorism into our study on climate change. The first is illustrated in this causal diagram behind me. And basically we're interested in, in examining the possibility that there might be a, comp a, a correlation between the visible effects of climate change and various terrorism organizations, uh, the success that they have attracting new recruits to join them. 
Now, we know that a number of organizations in the region are already citing climate change among their anti-Western grievances that they have. Oh, you know, Bin Laden's been talking about it off and on since 2002. To what extent is this message resonating? It's very, very difficult to tell right now. But we do think that if the effects of climate change become more visible and more pronounced, this message may start to resonate with their target audiences. And if so, we think that they're going to have increased success recruiting new recruits to their organizations, in which case the chances of future attacks would probably go up. Now, there's a much simpler reason that we're including terrorism also. And that is simply a matter of short-term threats versus long-term threats. So in a country like Algeria, where they're facing an immediate threat from al-Qaeda in the land of the Islamic Maghreb, are they going to allocate the necessary resources to try to develop the capacity to mitigate the possible negative effects of climate change 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? Perhaps, but it seems logical that they might devote a very large portion of the resources, as much as they need, to face the threat that they're facing here and now. And now Sanjeet is going to walk us through some of the things that we found when we calculated our vulnerabilities. OK, so I'm going to briefly review a few of our findings through a series of maps we created this past semester. Let's start out with population and migration vulnerability. Okay, this is similar to what Mark discussed earlier. Uh, one thing to notice on this map that may be difficult to determine is that Egypt is, in actuality, one of the most populated countries in the whole African continent. But upon first glance in this map, it's actually difficult to see. But this is because the regions of North Egypt and not the Nile are actually very densely populated. Um, now we're going to focus on what incorporating migration brings to the vulnerability analysis. Here is our out-migration vulnerability. From this map, it's clear that Morocco, Algeria, and Egypt are the countries that display the highest levels of outgoing migration. But we have to keep in mind that not all the people leaving these countries originated from within. A large number of people from sub-Saharan Africa traveled north to Morocco and Algeria to access Europe, or traveled to Egypt to ultimately access opportunity in the Arabian Peninsula. Let's move on. Now, according to this map, in migration vulnerability, these are the four countries that met the criteria of I'm going to oh. pick this out. Is that going to work? No, on, just okay. one second. Oh, the updates. Yeah, I don't want any updates. Quit. There we go. <laughs> we got everything we need right here. <laughs> now, according to this map, these are the four countries that met the criteria of poverty and recent history of ethnic warfare to be considered an increased risk because of incoming migration. Uh, Sudan's dark coloring tells us that it experiences amongst the highest levels of migration out of any country in Africa. It's also interesting to note what's becoming a common theme here, that the southern countries in the region are beginning to appear more vulnerable across all our indicators. Now, this trend's going to carry over to household vulnerability as well. Um, here you'll see the Sahel countries, again, scoring very poorly for household vulnerability, which you'll recall consists of civilian access to health care and education. Let's move on. Now, here we have physical vulnerability for North Africa. Um, we'll be taking a closer look at the weather events that make up the variation at the sub-regional level in a few moments. But with this map, you'll see some countries appear darker than others. For example, Mali and Niger appear darker than Algeria. Now, this is a tribute to the country's water vulnerability, which is a national ranking. Um, so if you recall, our water indicators were total groundwater availability, total water use, dependency ratio, and improved access to water. The darker countries in this map appear darker based off of poorer scores across these fronts. Now we'll move on to governance, atrocities, and terrorism. Now the governance indicators from this map, along with our household community indicators, which we looked at earlier, uh, give us our best guess at a country's adaptive capacity. Chad and Sudan's poor scores stem from their poor performance in governance. Uh, the darker subnational variation in Algeria represents terrorist attacks and political atrocities over the last 15 years. And we've now seen each of our individual indicator baskets, and now we're going to add them up and show you what we come up with. Now, here's the overall vulnerability of North Africa. The white region of this map indicates uh, areas without a reportable population or are uninhabitable. What's immediately clear here is a high vulnerability recorded across Sudan. Now, every inhabited part of Sudan falls either at the highest or second highest level of vulnerability for this map. It's also interesting to note that the higher levels of vulnerability recorded along the southern portion of the Sahel, which includes Mali, Niger, and Chad, and the northern portion of uh, Algeria. Now let's examine some of the indicators um, up close and at a regional level. Here we have Egypt and Sudan, overall vulnerability. Looking at both countries, it's again striking how vulnerable Sudan is. And remember, this is attributed to its poor scores on all previous indicators examined from the earlier maps. Um, let's move on to physical vulnerability. Looking at physical vulnerability, 
Each country appears fairly vulnerable throughout the country because of the poor scores from our water indicators analyzed. The variation you see within each country is due to the weather events recorded. Now we're going to look at two of them more closely. Drought and fire frequency. On the left, the highest levels of drought are seen in southeast Sudan and in northern Egypt, uh, around Alexandria, roughly. And although we do see droughts occurring in these countries, uh, we see a much higher incidence of fire reported, largely attributed to brush fires between the months of November and February. And you can kind of see that frequency play out in the map on the right here. Now let's move on to overall vulnerability for the Maghreb. Here's your overall vulnerability for the region, which includes Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. You'll note that the highest levels of vulnerability in the northern coast of Algeria. Algeria had lower scores on our national governance indicators and also had a much higher frequency of terrorist incidents and atrocity in comparison to its Maghreb neighbors. Let's move on to uh, physical vulnerability. Now here's the physical vulnerability map for the Maghreb and you'll notice the darker coloring along the northern coast of Africa. Uh, we can explain this primarily through one factor and that's drought. Let's move on. And you can see the uh, prevalence of drought within the region. I'm going to go ahead and forward the presentation over to Christian who's going to explain the relationship between terrorist incidents and overall vulnerability. All right, and one of the things that ArcGIS has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to sum the number of terrorist attacks that are occurring in each one of these vulnerability levels that you see. And although technically our model is trying to predict vulnerability to climate threats, we think that because it deals so much with government capacity to adapt to, to threats in general, we think that it might also predict regions where the specific countries will be unable to meet whatever threat comes their way to a certain extent. Now, if that were true, and if terrorism was the kind of threat that I might be describing, then we would expect to see a relationship between where these terrorist events are and the vulnerability levels. We would expect to see more in the higher levels of vulnerability. And that's actually, in fact, what we see. This was very, very interesting, I, I thought, that when we, when we did this. So we aggregated each vulnerability level for the square area, and then we summed the number of terrorist attacks in each one. And as you can see, levels one, two, and three, which if you can go back to the, the previous slide, mm -hmm. correlate to the yellowish areas that we have, and back, um, have very, very <laughs> few attacks per thousand square kilometers, less than 0.05. Whereas in level four, it jumps up to over two and a half attacks per thousand square kilometers. And in level five, we top out at just under five and a half attacks per thousand square kilometers. Now we also did a similar analysis with just our physical uh, vulnerability, and we're not trying to make any bold statements about climate change causing terrorism, but we thought we might as well perform the exercise since we had the capacity to do so. And we actually see a similar trend. It's not quite as pronounced, so the highest level of vulnerability here is seeing just over one and a half attacks per thousand square kilometers. But I did think that it was interesting, we all thought it was interesting, that we saw this same progression through the regions of physical vulnerability. Because this, obviously, whereas the overall vulnerability index takes into account population, and to some extent there are going to be <coughs> terrorist attacks where there are people, this doesn't have anything to do with population. And so we thought that this was an interesting fact to bring up for you all today. And now Mark is just going to take us out with a few policy implications. Um, so from our research, we came up with these three main um, policy implications. The first one being adaptive capacity, and then this is primarily in the Sahel region and Sudan, where we've seen that they score very badly on governance. Uh, water dependency and household vulnerability, so like access to public services, health care, um, which would reduce um, people's ability to cope with climate change. Uh, the second one is the helping the Algerian go government combat the terrorist threat. This has historically been done through the U.S. Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership. And um, programs like Operation Flintlock is something we think could be expanded elsewhere in the region. It's a, a training cooperation program between the U.S. and many of the North African countries uh, to combat the effects of terrorism. And terrorism from the standpoint of it exacerbating countries' ability to cope with climate change, this could be a potential aid. Um, and then finally, to improve water use efficiency. This is <coughs> primarily because countries in the region are heavily dependent on agriculture and ability to switch to crops that are less water intensive, um, improving in infrastructure like irrigation um, can help mitigate the effects of climate change on countries where water shortages um, is going to be a problem and um, reduce the impact on their economies. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Thank you all for coming. And, uh, now we need members of the other groups to come down. So we'll have to
right. Well, I guess my first question really is for all four groups. And I'll tell you a little bit of a struggle that we faced when we did the National Intelligence Assessment on Climate Change, and I want you to kind of help me how you would approach the same kind of a problem with based upon your experiences. One of the dilemmas we faced was we could look at the world today and predict where we thought states were vulnerable. Zimbabwe, the basket case, you know, Sudan, easy to pick. Uh, but we were trying to look at what the impact of climate change was going to be, and climate change is not a day after tomorrow phenomena. Extreme weather events are, but climate change is a decadal issue, usually two, three decades out. So we were trying to go 30 years in the future. So how do you come to grips with the question of today's basket case may be tomorrow's her hero? I mean, and again, I use Zimbabwe. If you went back 30 years, it was a very well-run country by some respects. One could argue about the plurality of it. But nonetheless, it was not a basket food, uh, food basket case as it is today. So, and so how do you look f in the future and try and anticipate how the vulnerability you derive today is going to change? Uh, Probably the one thing you know for sure is the demographics, but other than that, everything's on the table. Well, it seemed that one. Of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It seemed that one of the, as you noted in the earlier presentation, one of the primary shortcomings of our study is that it's not really predictive. We're basing most of our information on things that have already happened, and so because we've been removed from the actual science of how we go from temperature increases in the Indian Ocean to droughts in North Africa, we are very, very limited in our ability, I think, to, to help a great deal on this, on this matter. But at the same time, I, I well, no, I'm, someone disagrees. <laughs> well, no, I think, well, I think, first of all, it's, while I understand the separation between decadal climate change effects and, and extreme weather events like floods and droughts, I think it's a mistake to separate them completely because the, because extreme flooding now makes the effects of climate change 20 years from now worse. So I think, I mean, the, no, while, you while there's no, no hope of improving themselves in 20 years. Well, <laughs> no, it's not that. It's just that you, you, it's, you can't entirely separate them because they are related and one makes the other one worse. So, I mean, in terms of governance, you know, of course you can always hope that one can improve, but I think one of the things that we struggle with is how do you how do you change the time horizon of getting governments that now governments today to care about 20 years from now, regardless of whether you know they're going to whether the government governance situation is going to be a whole lot better in 20 years? How do you address you have to you have to deal with the governments that there are now because you are trying to solve a problem that comes 20 years down the road. So I think the struggle is the time horizon. I don't know if that that addresses, but I'm not. As, I mean, I'm not necessarily concerned that Zimbabwe is going to be so much better off in 20 years that we shouldn't be worried about them now. I don't. I mean, I don't think that's. Yeah, yeah I was good, just going to say on the issue of prediction. Uh, 30 years ago, we would have never predicted Zimbabwe is in the state it is now, <laughs> but that that might very well be because Zimbabwe is an outlier in these sets of cases. And so I, I do believe that, uh, that what's happening in the present will inform the future. So we would also be very surprised if uh, Somalia, for instance, was doing extremely well 20 years from now. So, but in terms, of, in terms of predicting about climate change, I think there were some interesting findings from our model. Like in uh, East Africa, we pointed out that in our model, the Democratic Republic of Congo looked pretty good. And so to think, why does it look pretty good in the composite vulnerability? Because um, the Democratic Republic of Congo has enormous struggles and very likely is going to have struggles in the future, but those are not due to climate change. So if you're specifically focused on the issue of climate change, Democratic Republic of Congo might not be on your radar, but in terms of larger governance issues, it might be. If I might just answer your question briefly, um, I, uh, the reason why the West Africa group 
um, focused on some of these um, more concrete governance indicators was to address this decadal issue because in order to be able to adapt to the climate challenges of the future, these countries will have to start making investments now. And so we were very careful to look at um, things like dependence on mineral resources that um, direct investment away from productive areas such as the real economy and development um, or climate change adaptation and put them into um, things like investing in the oil sector or uh, patronage politics. But, and so and we, we tried to focus on what are the countries that have these things that will direct investment away from um, adaptation projects. That was the way we dealt with it primarily. Other follow-ups, Rich? Or you no. Okay. Um, let me go to uh, Greg and then I think over here. So right behind you. Oh, you want to go? No? Yeah, uh, just yeah, take, go for yeah, it. Just yeah. ask a quick yeah, question. Sure, absolutely. Um, do, do any of your researchers have the op th This is really a <coughs> very impressive intellectual analysis. But I wondered if any of your researchers had the opportunity to travel to Africa to so some of the places <laughs> that you're talking about. Um, On well, a class-wide level, yeah. it's a sore subject because next year's class is going to get Sarah has been. Well, I mean, I haven't been in the context within the context of this this project. I mean, um, and I haven't traveled yet to the region that I studied, but I will be a week from today, I guess. But so, no, the answer to your question is no. But uh, as a follow-up, some yeah. of our researchers on our team will we'll be going. Yeah. I'll be there as of next week, as with Todd Smith and others. And uh, but then other people in other groups, like Bonnie. I don't know if you want to say. Um, in January, past summer, it was past summer. I spent some time in Ethiopia, and uh, in January, in the middle of the project, not related to the project, but I was also in Ethiopia then. And it was interesting to see <coughs> talk to the farmers and, and see things on the ground, and they are very concerned. They, obviously, the, uh, the prolonged drought and the heavy rainfall um, is, uh, is affecting their crops, their food security, and uh, they're, the, I got the sense that they really just don't know what they're going to do. The government's not responding. This the hell is creeping in. And so there's, um, there's definitely a real threat that is being felt by the people in, that, in the western area. My, <coughs> my second question was going to be if, if you felt that the uh, intuition that you gained is useful in guiding your more quantitative uh, analysis, but I think the answer that you're giving me is yes. Let me get started over to Greg and then I think. So all uh, four of your groups talked, um, used uh, governance as, as a factor in, in your analysis. But you, uh, could you talk more about what your indicators of governance were? How did you come to those conclusions? It was kind of interesting among the regions, and I think the West African region, in some respects, was was the most interesting because governance had seemed to play a larger factor on where the vulnerabilities were. Uh, in East Africa, that might be the case that governance is so universally bad across the across the area that it doesn't matter. Uh, but I'd like to know about your factors. I'd like to just follow the comment on Zimbab Zimbabwe, looking at where that was 20 years ago or even 15 years ago and now, and, and say, that's not an outlier. Look at Cote d'Ivoire, look at Kenya. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, if you said, where was the promise in Africa? Which countries are doing well? You would have said, outside of South Africa, which has its issues, you would have said Zimbabwe, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya the various regions in there now, some of the basket cases. Well, that's true, and I think that that just goes to show that as much as we can't say much about what's going to happen 20 years from now, climate-wise, no one in 1989 knew what Mugabe was going to do over the next 15 years, and no one could have, I mean, I mean, it's very difficult to predict political, the political climate as well, you know, so I think that that, you know, paying, a, I mean, obviously doing what we're already doing in terms of paying attention to domestic politics in these countries is going to be just as important as whatever kind of scientific information we can bring to bear in, on a predictive level, I think. So when you look at government capacity, <coughs> and you, you keep that in mind, you keep the sort of temporal aspect of climate change in mind, what, are, what exactly are you looking at? What are your indicators? There, um, we started out by using the World Bank, um, well, Professor Busby and the, and the team started out by using um, the World Bank Index of Governance. Um, and there are a couple measures. That's, that's split between um, a few quantitative indicators and also expert opinion. Um, and we took two components for that. One was a uh, voice and accountability, how responsive is the government to um, the needs and demands of its people. Another one was government effectiveness, how uh, good is the government at projecting its power into far-flung regions. Um, another component we used was an index of globalization, 
that um, was to sort of um, uh, measure openness. Yes, measure openness and um, how much uh, a foreign investment, also aid, would be able to come in to the country to help them out. Rule and of law. Rule of law. Control, control of corruption. corruption. Control of corruption. Um, so those are some indicators. Which to say, yeah. these are these are all of them except the ones, the new ones that you guys mm -hmm. included were World Bank World Development indicators, which they have problems in and of themselves. Some of them are, are um, I think some of us have different agreements about, or different disagreements about which ones we like more than others, but there, I think still we tried, if you look at the governance map and then you, you know, kind of read the news for a few weeks, it's, they're generally decent predictors of, of where the real serious issues in terms of governments that are repressive or just ineffective. I don't know if, but I you guys did. Some of the bigger questions <laughs> well. And we did, um, yeah. we struggled to put in things like this issue of oil and mineral dependency and also um, a, um, ethno religious diversity and in the group of, uh, in the case of Sarah's group, um, in, in terms of water access, just because these are a little bit more robust than the World Bank things which mm -hmm. change when the politics change. Mm -hmm. so. But also, I will say that the you know, the inclusion of the household and community vulnerability, which the intuition there is that if a country's population is educated and healthy, they are more likely to take advantage of a certain level of voice and accountability that they are allowed by their government. So those two things are kind of related as well. If you have, if the government is fine with everyone voicing their opinion, but ever, no one's educated, literate, or healthy, then that doesn't really, you know, translate. So the kind of, a lot of them are you know, related in, in how they affect the composite result. I think Frank had a, a first two finger, and then we'll, we'll uh, go to Rich, and then, uh, then I know I deemed time to the question, so we, we want to make sure you get to that. Okay. Well, I wanted to follow up act, actually on what Sarah just said. In, uh, <coughs> not all vulnerabilities are created alike. I was sort of wondering, first of all, about the weighting. And this governing, your definition of governance of vulnerability is an impressive one, but I, I, I was struck by this is a variable which uh, would have all sorts of multiplier effects that you know, aren't really captured or measured in your model. So, and not only are they related and spill over, but as I was thinking through and looking at this, there were you know, some obvious things, say about water efficiency and uh, other things, but they all boiled back down to more effective governance. So if you could uh, have a government that was able to do these things, you would have less of these problems and you would decrease, you would have a cascade effect on the other vulnerability uh, factors. And so I was somewhat surprised that there was less recommendations or less focus in the recommendations explicitly on uh, governance issues. So I, I guess it's two questions, methodological, kind of seems odd just to throw governance up there, weight it the same as other things, uh, and too why doesn't, do you agree that if that's fixed it has a, a profound effect on the other? Um, you raise a very important point about the relative weightings and, and the reason why we um, didn't weight governance more is just because we wanted to remain agnostic about what the differential effects would be in different places. We didn't have a good reason to say that in country X, governance would have this much more of an effect, and in country Y, it would have this much less of an effect, so we just decided to hold all the effects, um, to, to give them all equal weighting in terms of methodology. And I think also, I mean, what governance, you know, in the case of Southern Africa at least, there are two things related to this. You know, South Africa comes out less vulnerable to water stress, which people were kind of shocked at initially because they have huge water scarcity problems, but their government is relatively decent, at least according to our model, at getting the water that they do have <coughs> to people and to places where it is needed. That proves but my the point. That, you would but want, that would be in a governance variable, not in a water stress variable. Well, there, but there are a but there are, yeah. there's a number of things, uh, like, for example, governance and uh, child mortality under five would be highly correlated. But there are other things like the dependency ratio. Uh, no matter what level of governance you have, it, you can't change how much water is coming from another country into your own. Or you can't change necessarily the natural disasters, climate related natural disasters that, co that happen in your country. So certainly governance is correlated to some of the other factors and not as much to 
to others. And but oh, sorry, oh, I didn't know if you wanted to touch on that. Well, I was going to say also in terms of you know like like access to water, mm -hmm. you would think oh the government builds the pipes, that's great, but a government 20 years ago might have built those pipes. You know what I mean, so I think that there could be some differences between the infrastructure that has been built at some point and whatever government is in power now. But you're right, there is a, there is a fair amount of right. multicollinearity, dare I say, <laughs> um, <laughs> between between the government. <laughs> and also, if if our if we had all stood up here and said, well, if we just fix the governments in Africa, all of these problems <laughs> would go away. Just, just, why don't they just do better? <laughs> people people would have. I mean, that would not have gone over well either. So I think that you know, given that. Given that condition, we're interested in where is governance, you know, if you look at, it, at the Southern Africa final composite vulnerability, Zimbabwe and Mozambique look the same, but they are the same level of final vulnerability for different reasons. In Zimbabwe, it's a governance issue. In Mozambique, it's a confluence of a few other things. Right. But So it's looking at these different things together that really allows us to say, okay, these places look like they're suffering in the same way, but, but we're, we are policy and prescriptions have to be different according to why they are. Right. I, I wasn't suggesting that everyone should shut government better. I'd say it, there are governance, water management governance mm -hmm. issues. You can look at various mm -hmm. parts of the world that mm -hmm. face water management challenges and have come up with fairly unique and uh, very innovative governance solutions. And that's, that's where I was thinking of the recommendation section. That's okay. what and I think that's, that's directly relevant to one of the countries that kind of fell off of our map because they were doing okay was the North Africa group. We really learned about the, the beauty of autarky when we looked at Libya, yeah. right? Because, I mean, this is a government where on a voice and accountability scale, not doing so hot, you know. But at the same time, you know, Gaddafi's been in power for 40 years and he's had this vision that he's implemented for the Great Man-Made River Project and he's seeing it through, you know, and they're actually doing some pretty amazing things, like what you said, like in terms of the water policy yeah. in the country, That's that would be hard to guess from just looking at the government, you know, numbers, the, the governance indicators mm -hmm. that we got. And they got money. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do Rich and then, and then we'll do uh, ID right after that. Uh, and, and we'll get right to ID. Well, I'm going to kind of pile on the, the waiting question because, uh, and I'll just relay a an experience we had. We did very similar exercise to what you did in terms of looking at six spots around the world and having the <coughs> Pacific Northwest National Laboratory of DOE and the University of Maryland give us a assessment of what the climate change was going to do to these places and they used something called BRIM. I don't know if you studied yeah. that in your deal. Well then we had a group of experts come in and take a look at the results that they presented and I will tell you that regional experts, that is to say the people who really knew the region, came in and looked at the VRIM data and just threw up all over it, <laughs> uniformly. And it was a question of, uh, they didn't necessarily disagree with the individual observations on the parameters, but they really didn't feel that the weightings gave a correct assessment of what their particular country was like. And oh, by the way, they had no uniform way to weight them. So that the, the they real... Didn't, they didn't include governance at all. And yeah, yeah, right. And that right. was a big major flaw. Yeah. yeah. But they did, in the interest of Libya, I will say the North Africa study, we did come to exactly the same conclusion that, yeah, having money and being in charge and being able to force your own way <laughs> has a certain <laughs> advantage to having practically yeah. nobody in your country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it was kind of interesting how difficult it is to take quantifiable data and the lesson that we walked away from it with is you really have to put it with qualitative subject matter expertise to get finally the answer you want to get. Any comments on that? Or you yeah, I, would, I would just respond to that by saying, I mean, that's, that's certainly true that it's important to get the experts in there looking at the issues. Um, but at the same time, you have to have some sort of, of, of parametric, you know, yeah, exactly, in order to make the things comfortable because it, it, if you get a bunch of Africanists in a room that are all experts on one country, then you're going to get as many weights as you have countries. You're going to get, and so that, that <laughs> yeah. it makes it hard to aggregate. But your point's well taken about um, having that qualitative uh, focus. But yeah, yeah I'm a, I think it's important to point out, you know, this isn't, we're trying to get in the ballpark here. You know, there's a lot of things that we don't have data on or you just can't make data on. So from my experience living in Malawi for a few years, for the uh, tribal chiefs there, what chief you're under really matters. So we lived in a region where we had a really awful chief and the, the food security issue in our region was really bad, but if you went 10 miles away where they're under a different chief, it was much better. People were healthier, 
the forests were better taken care of. And so our model can't quite capture that detail. So if, if you're a regional expert, you will be able to know more of that detail. So this model gets more, has more of a ballpark approach. I did. Okay, uh, well, thanks guys. You guys did a wonderful um, job and you must put a lot of hard work uh, into all of this. I'm gonna raise just a little bit of a, of a concern but then offer a potential solution. So I, I'm not just critical for the sake of being critical, but <laughs> I'm actually gonna give maybe some, some feedback to, to, to untie this knot. Um, so my general observation across all of the, the projects and, and what Josh has done is that the models, um, well, I believe that parsimony is a virtue, right? If you can say a lot with a few variables, that, that's very important. Um, whereas your, the, the mapping exercises can become extremely complex. And I didn't see a terrible amount of consistency across the groups. So some of you had four baskets and different variables within those baskets. Um, some of you had five baskets, some included migration, some included religion. And I actually don't know what's important. Maybe religion's important, maybe it's not. Maybe improved irrigation's important, maybe it's not. Um, so when you create a very complex model with, with different baskets and variables that are within that, and, you know, a dozen or perhaps 20 variables, it becomes very difficult to know what's driving what, uh, what should be included and what's not. And people can always quibble with, well, why don't you put in GDP, right? Why don't you put in this? Why did you put in this? So um, simplicity is a virtue. Um, so here's, here's my way out of it. Um, <laughs> and people asked about future forecasts. And future forecasting is very difficult because we don't know what's going to happen and the climate models aren't terribly good. But you can definitely do in-sample predictions. You could take a vulnerability assessment from the 80s and 90s and see how well it predicts uh, disasters in the, in the last decade. And then we can start with a very simple parsimonious model, just say population. How well does population predict where disasters are going to hit? Then add another layer, say, uh, droughts and climate vulnerability. How well does that improve our predictive power? Then include religious diversity, GDP, and include these layers iteratively. Um, in, in statistics, we call it a Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian approach, where we're trying to see sort of how well the model fit uh, works. You might find that some of the things that you've included shouldn't be in there, and some of the things you really need to weight uh, more heavily. You can, you can kind of do it if you have a clear sort of dependent variable in mind and you try to do that in, in sample prediction. You could actually try to get at what layers should be included, what baskets should be included, what variables should be in there, and what can you uh, fruitfully ignore. So that's yeah, that. I think that's a really good point. I also think that, you know, on that note and also on the note that Professor Gavin brought up, I think that, well, in general, I think that a lot of us, while we never want to hear the letters ArcGIS again, we also would really be excited to have another crack at this. You know, because we, I feel like we've, especially in the last two or three months, I feel like we've learned so much about the way we did approach things that we really would be curious to try to, to figure out a better way to do it. I think that that's a great idea. I also think that one thing that I wish we had done was to combine various, uh, maybe two of the baskets to kind of compare them side by side and to pick different pairs of the baskets to see where <laughs> these things, or some indicators within the baskets to see where there was a lot of overlap, where some of these things are redundant, or what's just not very interesting at all. And I feel like, I, in, in a way, I kind of, I'm really excited to see what they do next year with the project, because I feel like we've kind of built a start. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just add on that, because you, you mentioned multicollinearity. Yeah. So, so here's a potential problem. <coughs> if you had two things that were very multicollinear, say you had infant mortality and access to clean drinking water, and you think they're very important, but they're they're very highly related to each other. Then you're just taking that point and you're yeah. doubling higher it. Yeah. On it. No, yeah. Exactly. You're making that look darker, where it's really a common metric that two variables two variables are capturing the same concept, but because they're collinear, you're you're just stacking the effect. I kind of want to ask Todd to, to have a weigh in on this. I can weigh in on this too. I mean, this, uh, I mean, it's it, the stepwise sort of approach. I mean, we're not really at a point where we're making. We're not really at a point where we're making causal inferences or, or even at a point where something like multicollinearity can come into play. Um, and, the, and the problem with sort of the stepwise approach, I guess, that you described to generating the model, does this variable work, does this not variable work, is that we're at a descriptive point in model building right now and sort of looking at what are potential causal processes and hypotheses. And so um, our, our intuition, and, and there are certainly lots of virtues to parsimonious um, models, but our intuition was to include as many uh, relevant variables and as many different specifications as possible to try to suss out uh, 
what are some of the underlying patterns in the data, and then move on to the step where we can uh, start to make some of these causal inferences um, when, a, when a parsimonious model will be more appropriate. And I will, at least in our, in our experience, I mean, we, understanding that the baskets already have, you know, several variables in them, we do have iterations of each one, you know, progressing, adding on top of each other. And really, our final model that really sticks at where Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Southern Malawi and Madagascar really, or Madagascar really stick out. The only real obvious difference in that one versus not including the water is the western region of Angola, which we could then go back and see what's causing that vulnerability and it was household. So to a certain extent when you have all of these, you can kind of begin to sort of, like you said, suss out what, you know, what's causing the greatest vulnerability. And I, and I mean, then there's also the question, well, isn't it important that in places where <coughs> you know, there's not access to clean drinking water, there are also, there's also an extremely high infant mortality. Don't we want to know both of those things? I mean, in terms of, at least at the as descriptive level. As long as level. mortality isn't caused by lack of, right. you know, access to the water. Yeah. So. Colin, did you want to weigh oh, in? Sure. Well, maybe, uh, I, I know Todd is chafing a bit. I don't know if you want to say <laughs> briefly anything about what we did in our waiting team initially that sort of t teed it up for, for these folks to have a certain sort of template to work with. I mean, I, I can uh, just give a, a brief background if anybody's interested. The, the basket that we chose for the household community and community variables um, were with this type of data, obviously parsimony is, is important, but especially in Africa, dealing with data availability is also an issue. So we needed to have something, uh, and they, we didn't get, Josh got into a little bit, but there are four sub-baskets. In each one of those baskets, there are two indicators. So we think that those two indicators say something about that, that basket, and uh, they were carefully chosen so that in no case was there was any country or region missing both of those sub-indicators. In some cases, there's only one indicator in each of those sub-baskets, but we do have something that tells us about that. So there's eight when there could have been four, but it, and, and we, we looked at correlations between those four, and we dismissed those that were, that were highly correlated, or, I mean, of course, that's a relative concept, but, um, of course, we still don't know, uh, statistical significance because we, we just don't have data. We haven't performed that exercise. This was more of an exercise in indexing than, than trying to determine real statistical significance. That's, that's definitely on the future research agenda. To be continued. All right. So, Cullen. Okay. Um, uh, first, I want to congratulate all of you for having done really excellent work. It's really exciting to see uh, th this project kind of come to fruition. And, and congratulations, Josh, on kind of helping them get through it. Uh, the comment that I wanted to make regarded the degree to which uh, some information about the economies of these different countries are integrated into the model. Because I think that, that when we talk about governance, we're talking about, <coughs> we're talking about the way that governments are going to res respond to acute crises, right, in, in many cases, right? And you could have an extraordinarily capable bureaucracy that does not simply have the material resources to invest in, in any kind of mitigation, right, or, or decreasing food security. Um, and, and I'm thinking sort of, of particular cases that are motivating this, right? So in, you know, in the early 90s, there's just terrible drought across southern Africa. And you don't see a re I mean, you see an increase in food insecurity in South, in, in South Africa, but you don't see widespread starvation and death. And that's because throughout this time period, right, South Africa has access to plenty of foreign exchange because it can sell diamonds to the rest of the world, and it has a reasonably competent government that can take that foreign exchange, that, right, that money from outside of the local economy, and then invest it in mitigating these issues. In a country that's highly dependent on agriculture right, for its exports, right, they're hit by a, by a dual crisis because you've got a drought going on, but you've also lost your primary mechanism by which you're going to generate the money in international markets that you can use to reinvest in in uh, mitigation. So I think in this case, while I understand why you're using kind of uh, mining, uh, mine commodities a as a proxy for bad governance, because regionally that makes a lot of sense, I think that if you could disentangle uh, that and have, you know, separate indicators for governance uh, 
and then mineral uh, resources, I think that you would find that when you have a competent, effective government and they have mineral resources, mm -hmm. they tend to do a much, much better job. Okay. So I, I think that, that in, in some, to some extent, you've got a little bit of that in the model, but I, I think that that just struck me as being kind of a, an area that, that, that's by and large missed. And I, I think that's one of the reasons that Southern Africa didn't use the mineral data was because we were looking at, and this was a problem in the process, is we were looking for things that were going to be specific to the vulnerability of the region. And mineral wealth in Southern Africa tends not to have a negative effect because you've got Botswana and South Africa that tend, like you said, to generally be better at spending it than other countries in West Africa. Um, yeah, we really just stuck with the regional approach, as you mentioned, because in, 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 in West Africa, it's the, the, the governments that have the resources are bad. And, and there's also this issue of, of, of lootable resources, too, that um, uh, things like um, diamonds that can be produced by panning uh, that um, different rebel groups, for example, can fight over the control of. So um, it, it, that, was th that was something that we struggled with, too. And it's, it, it's, um, you're right, it's like an interaction effect between the, the quality of the governments and also the presence of the resources that our model does not capture. That's true. Yeah, because just, you know, if I, if I walked in and I didn't know something about these different regions I, and I didn't know that there, was, there were plentiful mineral resources in Southern Africa that are actually associated with pretty effective governance, I would walk away from this with a very different kind of take-home point, right? So I would, it, it would just lead to a little bit of, of confusion. Other questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, we have this discussion, and that's a great point. I mean, concerning your uh, concern about um, Gover uh, government, you know, being capable, but at the same time, you may not have the capacity to respond. So we had the discussion, um, I mean, and that's why the, we chose the indicator of openness. Because, like, you may be incapable, but at the same time, if you're open, and you are, your, your markets are linked, or, you know, you have the capacity to uh, take, uh, you know, get help from, from the neighbors or the foreign donors, then it makes you less vulnerable in that context. So that was one of the, one of the indicators that we used just to, you know, because we didn't, we didn't have a very good data on that in, in the first place, but just to define it more, you know, in, in, a, in a more definable way, we use the term um, openness for that. So uh, I think that covers, uh, I mean, a little bit of it. And I, I would just point out that uh, while I do think um, how much money a government has to spend is really important. We thought about that and because the numbers are all national level, which we use a lot of national level indicators, but in terms of uh, the financial, financial resources, GDP or something like that, uh, there's just a lot of noise there. So for example, Equatorial Guinea has tons of money, but they really don't take care of their people. So that's captured in governance. Uh, and then there's, for most of the continent, I, you know, I don't really know if it matters if you have you know, $300 per capita opposed to 450 or something like that. So just looking at the, the numbers for GDP per capita, uh, they're either correlated with uh, governance, which was captured with that governance, or they just didn't really make sense with capturing the vulnerability. Also control of corruption. I mean, right. lootable, lootable resources, the ease with which they can be stolen for purposes other than investment. Yeah. So what you just mentioned yeah. is a hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Maybe it doesn't matter. Right. That's your hunch. And this hunch is something different. Maybe right. GDP does mm -hmm. matter, yeah. and I, I don't know. Well, time I should or should not include it. So yeah. if, you can, if you can say, okay, if I do include this, what is the predictive, how does it in, increase the predictive power of mm -hmm. right. the model, then mm -hmm. we can say, is, is your claim about GDP correct or is the model's claim about GDP correct? Right. We can adjudicate the same history thing. Yeah. And that's essentially our goal is to develop hypotheses of this kind. And so just you know, look at the issue in a couple of different ways and then try to test. And, and I would just add to that, right, the fact that they're collinear, it, it, I, I guess from an econometric perspective, let's say, or a methodological perspective, might get you out of some of those problems. But you, but I, I think that the, the whole point of this is to, to, to get you to the point where you can make specific kind of policy recommendations. And in that case, it's very important if one of them is driving the other one. Because then you can say, if you improve economically, then sort of, then, then naturally you will wind up with better governance. Or if, if, if it, in fact, the causality is primarily going in the opposite direction, then Right. You, you would come up with, with very different focuses in terms of your uh, policy prescriptions in a world where, where those two 
different things would be true, right? So yeah. one, one would look very different from the other. So that's why I think it's yeah. important to think about. And the initial motivation for not including GDP was that they were highly correlated with the household indicators, actually. And so, um, you know, there are sort of some methodological decisions that we had to make on whether or not we'd include GDP versus some of the other discrete education and, and household indicators, and then not to double count them. And so, I mean, but that, that raises some interesting questions about what's included and not included. And one of the interesting things across the groups is trying to figure out how robust the findings are depending on what weights you attach to the baskets or what indicators that you that you include. And so some of the sort of work that we'll have to do is sort of tease out how, you know, and this was one of the group's efforts to do difference maps, you know, to try and see, okay, did, you know, how different were, this, were the findings when you changed the, the model specification. Other, other questions, we've got about uh, five minutes. So we've got uh, other questions from any, anywhere in the room. Any last lick then that anybody, any of our panel or any of the other uh, cohort of students that want to get to uh, talk down? Well, if there's no more questions, I just wanted to get y'all to respond to, uh, I've tried and um, uh, everybody <coughs> dealt with it, but on the fringes, I mean, I keep saying that the, the main problem with, with climate change is, in predictions, is, is uncertainty surrounding it. I mean, we talked about Zimbabwe, we talked about Mugabe, and while nobody 15 years ago pr could have predicted where Zimbabwe would be today, I think a lot of people in 2000 could have told Mugabe that the land reform programs were not going to work. <laughs> um, now, if he doesn't listen to you, I don't, there's not much you can do about that. But uh, how, do you, how do you make recommendations in the, in, the, in the face of uncertainty, in the face of you don't know if there's going to be more rainfall or less rainfall? or um, how do you how do you deal with that type of um, not knowing? I mean, it's a, how do you make recommendations that are robust to that answer? I mean, the first way we looked at it was by sort of holding the climate change yes no issue in abeyance to an extent and saying, what are the factors that might make a country vulnerable to an exogenous shock, like a change in the price of its primary export commodity or something like that? You know, and and, and a lot of those would be the same factors, like like. Um, a high vulnerability at the household level or something like that. And so looking at these things and then I'm um, using that as a proxy for vulnerability to climate change. That's as, as close as we got because like I said before in our, our West Africa presentation, there really aren't, um, uh, the, there's, there's so much inconsistency among the climate models. Is it going to rain more? Is it going to uh, um, rain less? There are some that have literally the opposite predictions. So, Well, I think also one of the things that, you know, the more or less argument is questionable, but one of the things I think we might be a little bit more certain about is variability. And that, and, and you know, one of the prescriptions that you can make for that is management. If, if, you, have a, if you have an institution that can manage water <laughs> and can respond to changes that are happening now, then, you know, you, you could, you could, you know, you'd think that you would be less vulnerable to those changes. If you have an, in, you, you have a system by which you respond to climatic changes, whether they be a flood tomorrow or a six month long drought. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a variability issue that, that we were particularly interested in. And I, th I mean, I think there's also a lot of no regrets approaches. Yeah. For example, especially with what we looked at with deforestation. Mm -hmm. if, it, if there are more droughts, deforestation's bad. If there's heavier rains, deforestation is bad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, reforestation programs, no matter uh, which way you're looking at it, you turn out better. So, and there's a number of examples of things like that. Christian, you'll have the last word if you, anything you want to weigh in on this. Um, the only thing that was occurring to me was that I, I was thinking about echoing the importance of what our distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Engel, pointed out earlier, which is that this entire exercise for me really underlined the importance of qualitative data. You know, really knowing what is going on in these places. Like if we, you know, when we were looking at Egypt and Sudan, you know, the entire region is, was right in the middle of our vulnerability ranking on water access, right? Now the variation within the physical vulnerability pointed a little bit more towards Sudan. And if you had to, if you say that you only had limited resources and you had to identify certain areas to concentrate on, like are you w more worried about the fact that Egypt is so heavily dependent on irrigated rainfall 
or are you more worried about the fact that the peace agreement between North and South Sudan is unraveling? And because all of the, most of the vulnerability in Sudan, most of the more extreme vulnerability in Sudan was in the South, this population that is completely marginalized for the most part, especially if this agreement falls through, you know, where do you, where do you put the resources? And I think that th these maps are wonderful, and I'm excited about, you know, like I said, I'm excited about where they go next year. But it really did seem like they're a roadmap to qualitative study for me. And, and on that note, it, the, you know, they've really set us up to identifying the most vulnerable places so that we can go there and do qualitative interviews on the ground to say, is this your understanding of what your perceptions are of local vulnerability? And that's some of the work that we're going to be doing this summer. And obviously, the refinement that many of you have identified in terms of weighting and looking at, say, in sample prediction, we're hopefully going to get there. But I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, all four groups for their fantastic <coughs> presentations and for getting us to the point where we can start asking those questions uh, in the coming year. So thanks to all of you.